Srila Prabhupada left India. And of course he left on the Jala Dutta. So go back to the first volume. So I want to read just a little bit from the uh, Prabhupada Nilamrita about Srila Prabhupada leaving India. I can just read two pages. Prabhupada, so Omagana, Timidanda, Shah, Gadan, Jana, Shalakaya, Chakshu, or Minitam, Yena, Tazmai, Shikhanva, Namaha. So, before this particular section of the Prabhupada Nilamrita, there's a discussion of how Prabhupada was extremely determined to uh, go to America, and so much so that he, in order to get his free ticket, he sat on the steps of the Sri Samadhi Moraji's uh, office for hours and hours waiting for her to come out. And then he needed a P form to get out of India, and first they wouldn't give it to him. This is like, an, this is like a, a form that has to do with income tax. Uh, in other words, to get out of India, at least in those days, you had to show that you paid your income tax. And Prabhupada basically uh, probably didn't pay the income tax because he was a sadhu. You know, a sadhu was not going to pay income tax. So anyway, so they didn't want to give him the P form, and finally he went to the whole the boss and sat down. And he just pushed his way into the office, great determination, and finally they said, here's your form. So, uh, so finally, we'll start here. Finally, Mrs. Moraji scheduled a place for Shilpa in one of her ships, the Jaladuta, which was the sea messenger, uh, which was sailing from Calcutta on August 13th. Hmm. She had made certain that he would travel on a ship whose captain understood the needs of a vegetarian and a brahmana. Uh, Mrs. Moraji told the Jaladuta's captain, Arun Pandya, to carry extra vegetables and fruits for the Swami, and Mr. Chokshi, that's the secretary of Moraji, spent the last two days with Bhaktivedanta Swami in Bombay, picking up pamphlets of the press, purchasing clothes, and driving him to the station to catch the train. He arrived in Calcutta only a few days before the Jaladutta's departure. Although he had lived much of his life in the city, he now had nowhere to stay. It was it was as he had written in his Vrindavan Bhajan, which was written sometime before then. I have my wife, sons, daughters, grandsons, everything, but I have no money, so they are all in fruitless glory. Although in this city he had been so carefully nurtured as a child, those early days were also gone forever. Where have my loving father and mother gone to now? And where are all my elders who are my own folk? Who will give me news of them? Tell me who. All that is left of this family life is a list of names. Everybody should read this. Vrindavan Bhajan is really powerful, potent, and it, it'll awaken in you a spirit of renunciation. Out of the hundreds of people and determination to preach Krishna consciousness, not simply to be interested in your own Krishna consciousness, but to be interested in the Krishna consciousness of others, in the mood of Arjuna in preaching Krishna consciousness, fighting, Prabhupada said that preachers are in the mood of Kshatriyas. Of the hundreds of people in Calcutta who Bhaktivedanta Swami knew he chose to call on Mr. Sishur Bhattacharya, the flamboyant kirtan singer he had met a year before at the governor's house in Lukdam. Mr. Bhattacharya was not a relative, not a disciple, nor even a close friend, but he was willing to help. Bhaktivedanta Swami called at his place and informed him that he would be leaving on a cargo ship in a few days. He needed a place to stay, and he would like to give some lectures. Mr. Bhattacharya immediately began to arrange a few private meetings at friends' homes where he would sing and Bhaktivedanta Swami would then speak. Mr. Bhattacharya thought the sadhus leaving for America should make an important news story. He accompanied Bhaktivedanta Swami to all the newspapers in Calcutta, the Hindustan Standard, the Amit 
Amrita Bazar Patrika, the Yugantas, the Statesman, and others. Bhaktivinoda Swami had only one photograph, a passport photo, and they made a few copies for the newspapers. Mr. Bhattacharya would try to explain what the Swami was going to do, and the news writers would listen. But none of them wrote anything. Finally, they visited the Dainik Osumati, a local Bengali daily which agreed to print a small article with Bhaktivedanta Swami's picture. Mr. Bhattacharya continued to assist Bhaktivedanta Swami with his final business and speaking arrangements. Mr. Bhattacharya speaks here, quote, we took a higher taxi to this place and that place, and he would go for preaching. I never talked to him during the preaching, but once when I was coming back from the preaching, I said, you said this thing about this, but I tell you, it is not this, it is this. He was arguing with Prabhupada. I crossed him in some way or argued, and he was furious. Whenever we argued and I said, no, I think this is this, then he was shouting. He was very furious. So here was this guy who was helping him, you know, this professional kirtan singer, which basically means he probably wasn't following the rules and regulations, which is part of the professional kirtan uh, scenario in India. But probably just really wanted to, like the Shinya guru, really wanted to make the philosophy very clear in people's minds, even this guy's mind. He said, you are, after this is Prabhupada, Prophet said, you are always saying, I think, I think, I think. What is the importance of what you think? Everything is what you think, but it doesn't matter. It matters what Shastra says. You must follow. I said, that's the Bhattacharya, I must do what I think, what I feel. That is important. He said, no, you should forget this. You should forget your desire. You should change your habit. Better you depend on Shastras. You follow what Shastra wants you to do and do it. I am not telling you what I think, but I am repeating what the Shastra says. Whew. Wow. The day before his departure, Bhaktivedanta Swami traveled to nearby Mayapur to visit the Samadhi of Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. Then he returned to Calcutta. He was ready. He had only one suitcase, an umbrella, and supply of dry cereal. He did not know what he would find to eat in America. Perhaps there would be only meat. If so, he was prepared to live on boiled potatoes and the cereal. His main baggage, several trunks of his books, was being handled separately by Sindhya's cargo. Two hundred, three volume sets. The very thought of the books gave him confidence. Actually, one of the devotees gave me a present of one of the books the other day. I have it in my house. We're going to put it in a uh, glass case when we finish all the construction and everything. Like it's one of the original books that Prabhupada brought over. When the day came for him to leave, he needed that confidence. He was making a momentous break with his previous life, and he was dangerously old and not in good health. And he was going to an unknown and probably unwelcoming country. To be poor and unknown in India was one thing. Even in these Kali Yuga days when India's leaders were rejecting Vedic culture and imitating the West, it was still India. It was still the remnants of Vedic civilization. He had been able to see millionaires, governors, the prime ministers simply by showing up at their doors and waiting. A sannyasi was respected. The Shimon Bhagavatam was respected. But in America it would be different. He would be no one a foreigner, and there was no tradition of sadhus, no temples, no free ashrams. But when he thought of the books he was bringing transcendental knowledge in English, he became confident. When he met someone in America, he would give him a flyer. Srimad Bhagavatam, India's message of peace and goodwill. It was August 13, just a few days before Janmasmi, the appearance day anniversary of Lord Krishna, the next day would be his own 70th birthday. During these last years, he had been in Vrindavan for Janmashtami. Many Vrindavan residents would never leave there. They were old and at peace in Vrindavan. Bhaktivedanta Swami was also concerned that he might die away from Vrindavan, 
That was why all the Vaishnav sadhus and widows had taken vows not to leave even for Mathura, because to die in Vrindavan was the perfection of life. And the Hindu tradition was that a sannyasi should not cross the ocean and go to the land of the Malechas. But beyond all that was the desire of Shilavati Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And his desire was non different from that of Lord Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had predicted that the chanting of Hare Krishna would be known in every town and village in the world. Mr. Bhattacharya and Bhaktivedanta Swami took a taxi down to the Calcutta port. Bhaktivedanta Swami was carrying a Bengali copy of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, which he intended to read during the crossing. Somehow he would be able to cook on board, or if not, he would starve. Whatever Krishna desired, he checked his essentials, passenger ticket, passport, visa, P form, sponsor's address. Finally, it was happening. Srila Prabhupada, with what great difficulty I got out of the country. Some way or other, by Krishna's grace, I got out so I could spread the Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Otherwise, to remain in India was not possible. I wanted to start a movement in India, but I was not at all encouraged. The black cargo ship, small and weathered, was moored at dockside, a gangway leading from the dock to the ship's deck. A gangway is like, uh, just just like a wooden, you know, wooden platform that you walk up, like planks, like walking, the, it's not exactly like walking the planks, but it's tilted, so you walk up here, gangway, that's called a gangway. Uh, it's not like the modern uh, ships that you actually pull in and then the dock comes to meet the ship and you're just like rolling your bags and your booze off the ship. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Europe it's like that, isn't it? When the ships go from one country to another, everybody has these little trolleys with booze in it. That's their consciousness. So Indian merchant sailors curiously eyed the elderly saffron dressed saddle as he spoke last words to his companion in the taxi and then left him and walked determinedly towards the boat. For thousands of years, Krishna Bhakti had been known only in India, not outside, except in twisted, faithless reports by foreigners. And the only Swamis to have reached America had been non-devotees, Mayavadi impersonalists. But now, Krishna was sending Bhaktivedanta Swami as his emissary. And then finally, the other words of Mr. Bhattacharya. He was alone a lone fighter. When he left, there was no one on the shore to bid him goodbye. No friends, no supporter, no disciple, nobody. Even if you call me, I was not a disciple of his. I was a disciple of somebody else. So I was not his follower, but due to shared love, I had very much respect for him. So I was the only person standing on the shore to say him goodbye. No one was with me. I could not know that it was such an important thing. Whew. It's amazing. So maybe we're going to Bhagavatam. The, the point is, if you actually think about it, like Calcutta was Prabhupada's hometown. So obviously, you know, Prabhupada had acquired many different acquaintances in Calcutta. I mean, he was brought up in Calcutta. His family was in Calcutta. Of course, his businesses were in different places. Uh, but basically, Calcutta was his hometown. And there he was leaving his hometown where his family was before, his father, his mother, his sisters, everybody. And nobody was there to see him off. You know, it's just like, it's like heart-wrenching when you think about it. Like leaving somewhere where you spent your whole life and then going to a country that you don't know if they have vegetables. Whew, that's pretty heavy. With practically like 
roughly said ten dollars worth of rupees, which he wasn't able to change anyway, because in America nobody would accept rupees, and just a few cases of books. I mean, that is real Abhaya Sattva Shamashudhi, Jnana Yoga Vapastati, the saintly quality of being free from fear uh, because he is completely convinced that Krishna is there. That's how one becomes free from fear. Okay, so unless there's some comments, we'll go on to the Srimad Bhagavatam. And, all right, we'll read from Srimad Bhagavatam. 10th canto, 10th chapter, text 18. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. <coughs> Sadhu Nam Samad Chitanam Mukunda Chalanaishanam Upekshai King Dwana Stambar Asadbir Asad Ashrayahi Sadunam Samachitanam Kunna Chadanaishanam Upeksha Kim Dana Stambar Asadbir Asad Ashrayahi Sadhunam Samachitanam Mukunda Chadanaishanam Upeksha Kim Dana Stambar Asadbir Asad Ashrayahi Sadhunam Samachitanam Kunda Chadanaishanam Upeksha Kim Dadha Stambhaya Sadvira Sadashraya Sadunam <coughs> of saintly persons. Samachitanam of those who are equal to everyone. Makunda Chadana Ishinam whose only business is to serve Makunda, the Supreme Personality of God. <coughs> And who always aspire for that service. And who always aspire for that service. Upek Chahai, neglecting the association. Neglecting the association. <coughs> Kim, what? What? Bahai, rich and proud. Rich and proud. Asad Bihi, with the association of undesirable persons. With the association of undesirable persons. Mm. 
Asad Ashayahi. Taking shelter of those who are Asat or non devotees. Taking shelter of those who are Asat or non devotees. Mm. Translation. Saintly persons, sadhus, think of Krishna 24 hours a day. They have no other interest. Why should people neglect the association of such exalted spiritual personalities and try to associate with materialists, taking shelter of non devotees, most of whom are proud and rich? Do we repeat? Saintly persons, sadhus, think. Say the of Krishna, 24 hours a day. Of Krishna, 24 hours a day. They have no other interest. They have no other interest. Why should people neglect the association? Why, Why should people neglect the association of such exalted spiritual personalities? Of such exalted spiritual personalities. And try to associate with materialists. And try to associate with materialists. Taking shelter of non-devotees. Most of whom are proud and rich. Most of whom are proud and rich. So, purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shilpapad Shilpapad Ki. A sadhu is one who is engaged in devotional service to the Lord without deviation. Bhajate Vam Ananyabha. That means, worship me, Ananya, without any other activity. So then, Titikshiva Kurunika Sudha Sarvadeena Ajata Shatva Shunka Sarva Sada Bhushana. The symptoms of a sadhu are that he is tolerant, merciful, and friendly to all living entities, he has no enemies, he is peaceful, he abides by the scriptures, and all his characteristics are sublime. That's from the Bible time. Third canto, 25th chapter, text 21. A sadhu is Surida Sarvadeina, the friend of everyone. Why then should the rich, instead of associating with sadhus, waste their valuable time in association with other rich men who are averse to spiritual life? Both the poor man and the rich man can take advantage of the Krishna consciousness movement, and here it is advised that everyone do so. There is no profit in avoiding the association of the members of the Krishna consciousness movement. Narottama Das Thakur has said, Satsanga chari koinu asate vilash te karane lagila ye karma bandha pongs. If we give up the association of sadhus, saintly persons engaged in Krishna consciousness, and associate with persons seeking sense gratification and accumulating wealth for this purpose, our life is spoiled. The word asat refers to an avaishnava, one who is not a devotee of Krishna, and sat refers to a vaishnava, Krishna's devotee. One should always seek the association of vaishnavas and not spoil one's life by mixing with all vaishnavas. In Bhagavad Gita, the distinction between Vaishnava and Ovaishnava is enunciated. Dhamam duskritino mudha prapajante narada maha mayaya paritta dhana asuram bhavam ashita. Anyone who is not surrendered to Krishna is a most sinful person, duskriti, a rascal mudha. And the lowest of men, Naradama. Therefore, one should not avoid the association of Vaishnavas, which is now available all over the world in the form of the Krishna conscious movement. Great. So, Sadhanam Samachitanam Makunda Chadanai Shinham Upekshakim Danasnam Bhai. So, Omagana, Timananda Shah, Gananjana Shlakaya, Chakshul, and Minitam, Gena Tosmai, Shi, Gurave Namaha. So, here, the word, of course, Vaishnava is used, and uh, Prabhupada even said that the uh, Christians can be considered Vaishnavas too. It's interesting. Or, 
any religion, if they're dedicated to God, can give some advice on others. However, there's a distinction. I'm not going to make a sectarian distinction right now. I'm going to make a distinction based on Shastra, not based upon the temporary designation, whether one is Jewish, Christian, Hindu, blah, blah. Like, of course, blah, blah is not a religion. Mm -hmm. But what I, the distinction is based upon whether one is a Kanishta, Majjama, or Uttama, Adhikari. And in the Kanishta category, we have people doing devotional service in the modes of passion and in the mode of ignorance as well as in the mode of goodness. Uh, but this is Lord Kapiladev's statement because Prabhupada here is quoting from Lord Kapiladev about the qualities of a Vaishnava, the picture of Kuruni Kasu or Dasar of the Dayanam. That's from the third canto, Lord Kapiladev's instructions. So Lord Kapiladev also talks about devotional service and devotees in different modes of nature. So devotional service in the mode of goodness is one is doing it basically to get liberated, to get the hell out of the material world. And in the mode of passion, you're doing it just because you want some gain for it. I mean, let's, let's take the example of uh, Shukracharya. Everyone's heard about him. He's the seminal guru, Kula guru. And uh, Shukracharya, <coughs> he advised Bali Maharaj to worship Vishnu. So it appears, you know, the Vaishnava. Wow. And, but when Vishnu came, he said, no way, Jose, don't give it all to Vishnu, he's coming to take everything away. So, that's the emotional service in the mode of uh, passion, that he wants something for it. So it's, <coughs> so you actually find that <coughs> amongst the devotees, and also the devotees in the Christian consciousness movement. And the symptoms of those in the mode of passion and ignorance are envious, proud, going on the internet and criticizing other devotees. That's not mentioned in the third candle, <laughs> but you know, critical, you know, envious and proud, finding fault like that. Whereas one of the mode of goodness doesn't really find fault. And also there's devotional service that's transcendental, <coughs> which it's described by Lord Kapilade. It's like where one's mind automatically flows to the lotus feet of Krishna, like the Ganges or rivers, flow to the ocean. That's a transcendental devotional service. So, insofar as our association is concerned, we have to be careful. I mean, here's another example of devotional service in the modes. Uh, then uh, Daksha. Everybody knows Daksha? I mean, he was such a great personality. He even saw Lord Vishnu. You know, he was uh, doing devotional service and it was his authorized devotional service. It wasn't that, you know, he just dreamt up his own devotional service. His devotional service was given to him by, by Daddy, Lord Brahma. And his devotional service was go out there and propagate the race. <laughs> You go have a whole bunch of kids. Yeah, he's a prajapati. Yeah, that's his devotion to service. Anyway, and Krishna actually says, you know, that uh, sex life according to the rules and regulations and dharma is a representative of him. There's nothing wrong with that. But he was doing it with a motivation. See, it was authorized devotion to service. Nothing not authorized about it. But what was the motivation, or the mixed? You know, first of all, he wanted to satisfy his uh, preceptor. But it was mixed with a desire to enjoy food, of desire. there's passion. And so what happens is when you have a desire for something, you know, we know from the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Jayato's uh, when one is in the mode of passion, you're attached to the results, and when you don't get the results, guess what? You get angry. Or, nowadays, depression. 
and you're depressed. And then you have to take some pills and go see a psychiatrist or something like that. So anyway, so you'll get what you want. It's like, ah. it's like you see sometimes we're, it's not me driving, but I mean someone else is driving the car and I'm in the car and someone uh, pulls out in front of us real quickly and the person who is driving the car, which I'm in, pushes the horn down. <laughs> you can push it down, but not keep it down for two minutes. I want to teach him a lesson. Oh my God. Actually, in Australia, if you do that, they come out and they beat you up. That's why when I was in Australia, I asked the devotees, why does no one ever honk the horn here? So it's because they, they come out of the car and they, they smash it. So, so anyway, so that's frustration. And that indicates if we're getting angry or depressed or something, that means it's the mode of nature we're in right now. It's not really shoot the Vaishnava. Vaishnavism. So, in other words, <clears throat> so when we're looking for association, uh, we should find those who are transcendental. I mean, like Prabhupada. I mean, here's an example of Prabhupada. He was coming to America, not like everybody else coming to America. You know, as if the Statue of Liberty give us your poor and whole masses yearning to be free, right? Actually, uh, there was one person in the U.S. government, I know, I'm not going to mention his name, who added a line to that. And he said, yearning to be free, but they must have sufficient resources. <laughs> Did you hear about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway. So, you know, people come to America because it's the land of opportunity. It was the land of opportunity. Until the present situation occurred. Anyway, so that so it was the land of opportunity. So Prabhupada came to America. He wasn't thinking, wow, I'll enjoy, I'll get a lot of disciples, I'll go to Disneyland. I don't even know if Prabhupada heard about Disneyland. Probably not. He was, he was just thinking, what was he thinking? Let me please my spiritual master. And let me carry out Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's prediction that in every town and village his name would be heard. That was, that's pure devotional service. That's a sadhu. Because the word sadhu is very interesting. This, in this particular verse, this particular verse, you have asad bir, asad, ashraya, and also Sadhunam. So the same uh, word is there, which is sat. You understand sat? It's like you have this sat, chit, and ananda. Everyone wants ananda without sat. Does everyone understand that? Everyone wants bliss, but they don't want to be absorbed. They want bliss in the material world. Everyone wants bliss in the material world, but you can't have that without sat and chit. That's why sat and chit come before Ananda. So anyway, sat basically means eternal. So a sadhu, or a sadhu nan of the sadhus, is always absorbed in the eternal. Nasato, another verse in the Gita, what is it? Nasato vijate babo, na babo vijate sadhana. Who we are up in Drishta one verse twenty one twenty on Sadhva Darshadi. The Sadhu considers the things that have a beginning and an end, the things that are temporary, to be like will of the wisp, unreal. In other words, he he may see a fancy car. I always use the example of Tesla. He sees a Tesla. Instead of like me thinking, wow, fantastic. He's, seeing, he's thinking, it's temporary. Yes, it's there. We can use it in Krishna's service, but it's temporary. He doesn't go, wow. You never hear a Prabhupada go, wow. 
Like we go wild, right? This morning I was walking and I saw the full moon. Or it's not quite full because two days ago it was full. I went, wow. <laughs> you know, so, so it was beautiful. So I went, wow. What can I say? And that, but probably never, you never go, wow. You know, he probably was not enamored by any of the temporary things of this world, like we are, isn't it? Wow. Look at that computer. Wow. Like some romantic man going, wow. Look at that beautiful girl, or the girl will think, wow, isn't he macho? Or Wapo. Wapo, sorry. Wapo. That means, anyway. <laughs> I'll translate for it, handsome. <laughs> so, you know, so, but Prabhupada never said, wow, because he wasn't like, he was sadhu. He, he's being, you know, it's temporary. He was a temporary, he's wow. So what's a wow about it? And so, but when he would see something beautiful like a kirtan or the deities, just like I got a message yesterday on WhatsApp, or two days ago, what's that? Because uh, I had sent a picture of Balaram, of, not of Balaram, but a picture of Radhika Lokananda Balaram's appearance day. I got a wow back from the devotees. Some of the devotees said, wow, these are the most beautiful deities, and well cared for deities in the movement. And that was devotees in Germany who said that. So that's a wow. Because that's eternal. That's eternal. So that's really what a sadhu is. He's absorbed in the eternal. And of course, the eternal is, according to Srila Prabhupada, Krishna and those things which are related to Krishna. Of course, you also have sadhus who are impersonalists, but they cannot remain absorbed. They may be come to the point of temporarily being absorbed in the eternal, but the Bhagavatam says, Ruya Kachena Panam Padam. Ultimately, they fall down from that so-called absorption in the eternal, you know, in the Brahman, in the energy of the Supreme Personality of God. So in other words, even in, like Prabhupada here says, it's very interesting in this verse, he said, uh, one should not avoid the association which is now available over the world in the form of the Krishna conscious movement. So even in the Krishna conscious movement, you have to distinguish I mean, that's what Rupa Goswami says, you know, for someone who's just chanting Hare Krishna, you offer respects to the mind, if someone is initiated, you offer, you know, friendship, and someone who's more than, so it, it, then you serve that particular person. So you have to have that ability to discriminate. And discriminate means to be able to see someone's actions and words. Not simply, you know, sentimental what we mentioned many times before, uh, let's say outside of the Krishna conscious movement, there's people who lead kirtans that'll make you cry. But they may be eating meat. I mean, I'll give that example. Uh, this fundraising concert we had one time, and the, uh, the whole band, they were getting, you know, they're getting our congregation. Oh, there's someone who chanting about crowd, Radha and Krishna. Oh, Govinda, Radha, Radha. And then afterwards, we had to supply the band with liquor after the concert. So, so I'm not saying, hopefully it's not going on in our movement amongst the devotees. You know, I'm not going to go down and check the walk-in refrigerator after, after this concert. But you have to, even amongst the devotees, you have to be able to distinguish who do you want to serve, who do you want to associate with. And it's, it's, it takes some discrimination. Those are absorbed in sat, sadhu. Okay. On a happy note, not temporary video games. Happy note, all the.